Welcome to this new lesson on the Pioneer School Lesson 28. Today in this lesson I want to talk about communion, something I haven't talked about before. And it's going to challenge you and provoke you. And you see that communion is it's much more than what people have made it today. It's, it's almost like baptism in water where pe some people think that baptism in itself safe, like we see in the Catholic Church and Lutheran Church. But then the reformers went against that and went on the other side and said that baptism is just a symbol. The same with communion, that the Catholic Church believed that communion actually become the body and blood of Jesus, but then the reformers went on the other side and said that communion is just a symbol. But the Bible is very clear, communion is not just a symbol. And, and I'm going to read some verses about communion and talk a little about it here. And then I want to put everything together we have been looking at onto now, where we are going to look at Jesus who is sent on everything. And when we come together in small groups, I want to introduce you what we call in, up and out. When we come together, we have in to each other, we have up to God, and then we have out to other people. And this is simple models, simple ideas that can help you to come together with other people and know what to do and make disciples. So I think you'll love it. God bless you and look forward to this. Hello and welcome to this lesson 28 on the Pioneer School. Today we want to talk a little about church and want to put the things together we have been learning through the whole Pioneer School and especially through the last lessons. And I'm really excited about this teaching and some of the things you're going to hear is new. Especially when I talk about communion, this is something I'm going to talk more about today and I haven't been talking a lot about that before any, in any other video. And I'm really excited to share that with you. And some of the things you are going to hear is something you heard before, but I want to somehow put it together and give you some simple tools so you in your everyday life can start to meet. Meet in the homes, two, three, four, five, ten people. Meet out on the street, meet in cafes, meet all over and understand what how you do church, what church is, how, what do you do? This is a question many people ask. Yeah, now we have heard the teaching, what about this? What do we do when we come together? And I hope that this teaching will help you and give you some simple tools you can use. I will start with uh, praying. God, I thank you for what you're doing and I thank you for everyone who has seen this video that you will help me first to share this word and help them to receive it. Help us to be free from our church tradition, our fear, our program, our control. And help us to be your body, Jesus. Help us to be a member of your body and live the life you want us to live in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to start with uh, just looking at the, the foundation we are building on. When we come together, it's because we love God and we love each other. Everything in the Bible is spent on love. If you don't have love, you have nothing. And here we have the great commandment. That is the commandment Jesus has given us and everything is built on that. That we love God with everything in us and we love the na our neighbor as ourselves. We need that. We need the love for God and love from each other. And the closer we live with God, the more love we have. Why? Because the love is poured out in our heart by the Holy Spirit. But it's not only about loving, it's about loving God and loving our neighbor. How do we then love our neighbor? How do we love God? How do we obey God? The Great Commission, go out, make disciples of all nations baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything he has commanded. So this is the foundation. When we come together, we should love God and we should love each other. And then the focus is also to go out, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey what Jesus has commanded. 
how do we, like, what have Jesus, like, let's say it like that, how do we do that? How do we go out and make disciples of all nations? And that is Luke chapter 10 we have been looking at before, where Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. And then he continued, go and find a person of peace. Stay in their house. Eat and drink what they serve. Heal the sick and preach the gospel. This is how we do it. So how do you make disciples in your everyday life? You understand what Jesus is saying. And you go out and you look and you find that person of peace. And then you stay with them. You eat and drink what they serve. And then you heal the sick and preach the gospel. Yeah, but how? What do we then do when we have found that person of peace? What do you do when we sit with them and have eaten and preached the gospel? And that is some of the things I will focus upon uh, on here. But this is some of the things we have been looking at before. And then we have been looking at the family is like, in a church is like a family. And how we are supposed to grow people, not in numbers, but from babies to young ones to fathers. We need to grow people in maturity. So this is some of the things I've been speaking about in the last lessons. Have you not seen them? I recommend you to go in and see them. Today in this lesson, I will try to focus on the four things we read here in Acts 2. Uh, 42, and then I'll try to give you a simple uh, model of how to do it. The fourth thing we read about the early church, they, were devo they devoted themselves to a, like the first thing, apostles' teaching. To the fellowship, to the breaking and bread, and to the prayer. We read about that in Acts 2, 42. So that was the four things, the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, Written and bread and prayer. And I think that is somehow a, a good picture of what the early church did when they came together. They came together for the apostles' teaching. Remember that time they did not have a Bible. The only testimony, Jesus had died, he had went to heaven, the Holy Spirit was down here. So the only people, some of the people who have been walking with Christ and have heard his teaching was the apostles. Now this is written down here in the Gospels. It's written down here in the letters. So here we have the apostles' teaching. So when we come together as believers, we come together with the focus on the Word of God, the Bible, what do the Bible say? And, and, and it's okay to read, read books, it's okay to read other things, but that should never be the focus. The focus should be the Word, what the Word is saying. They also came together about fellowship. Fellowship is really important and we're going to look more on that. And bread and break, that is communion and prayer. The focus, when we come together, the focus is Jesus. Jesus is the center of everything. He's the head. We are the body. We are members of his body and he's the head. And Jesus is the center in everything we are doing. And I'm going to come with a simple model here called in, up, and out. Where we are going to look at the in, the fellowship with each other, the up, the fellowship to God, and the out, the fellowship to people out, or reaching out to people out in the world. But Jesus is the center of everything because in, that is to each other. We, Jesus has put us together as a body. So we cannot be one body without Jesus. Jesus is the center in our fellowship up to God. Jesus is the center again because how can we have fellowship with God without Jesus Christ? And out to the world, Jesus is the one who called us to go out. So Jesus is the center of everything. The model here in, up and out is just a simple tool you can do when you start to meet people. So I... When you gather people during the week, when you meet in the homes, to have that in, up and out, that when you are together, it's not just for in. It's not just for having fellowship with each other. It's good to have fellowship, but you also need to have fellowship with God. But it's not, it's not enough to just come and be together with each other and have fellowship with God. You also have to have a focus 
of discipleship or reaching the world. And, and therefore, the in, up and out it is, is a simple tool you can use when you start to meet people, gather people during the week and come together. And I want to look at it and then go deeper in some of it. In. That's the first thing. Into each other. Fellowship with each other is very, very important. We need each other. We cannot live this life alone. We cannot live this life alone. When I'm saying, or we are saying, you are the body of Christ. The, the, the challenge with English is that you can mean you as like you, one person I talk to, but if I'm talking to many people, it means you. In Denmark, we have two different words for it. Um, but in English, you. But what is you? You is not you as one person, because one person alone is not the whole body of Christ. One person alone is the member of the whole body of Christ. And we cannot live this life alone. We need each other. And it's so important to have fellowship with each other. It's so important to come together. And especially to build each other up. And in, in the beginning, and when Satan is coming, and lies, and fears, and doubt, and all of this, that we are connected to each other. And I want to say something about this, because... How often do you meet? In, in the early church, we read that people met daily. They met daily. They met daily at the temple area, at home, the bread, the bread. But it was only something they did in Jerusalem in the beginning. Uh, other times, we read that sometimes they met one day a week. <laughs> and it was different from place to place. And it's the same today. Maybe you live in fellowship with people around you where you can come together daily. Beautiful, do that. But other times, you can only, because of work and distance and other things where you are right now, can only come together one time a week. So there is no rules of how often you should meet. <laughs> and just want to say that because everyone, when you talk about church, people are like, yeah, but how do we do it? Do you meet one time a week or two times or three times? Come together as much as you can. <laughs> And see how God is leading you. But I want to talk about we are we are members of the body. And I want to read something here from 1 Corinthians 12. Just as a body are one, but have many parts, but form one body. The same it is with Christ. We who were baptized, we were baptized by one spirit to form one body. So we are talking about we have one spirit to form one body. <laughs> but we have different members. The hand needs the body. The ear belongs to the body. And the eye cannot see, I don't want to be eye anymore. And the ear cannot see, I want to be a ear anymore. So we have different functions. And all in all, that make us one body. And I would say, when you come together, care for each other. Take time to understand that you are different. But find out what part of the body you belong. And then come together and talk. Come together and say, how are you? How have your week been like? What is happening in your life? What are you struggling with? Are you doing good? And I think, I know many bigger churches, it's so easy when things become bigger, where you come to a church and you go and you say hi to some people and you go home without really talking with people because it's easy to disappear in a big crowd. And therefore, I believe that, that the best form for discipleship in the small group, Jesus said, when two and three come together, I am in the midst of you. And I encourage you to try to meet two and three people during the week. Try sometimes meet more. And then try to meet in smaller groups of two and three people. 
and then start with the in to each other. How are you? How are you? Are you good? Are you not good? Are you fighting with something? And talk about what God has done during the week. And that is an easy model to do. You come together and you, what do you also do? You eat. If you can, try to do what Jesus is saying when you come into a house, eat and drink. Try to eat together, share food together if you can. Because when you come together and you eat something together, that is a good way to relax. You relax and then you talk, you have fellowship with each other, you talk over the food, maybe you can prepare the food. And then in the end of the food, when you have like a love feed, feast, how they did in the early church, in the end of the food, you bread the bread. You share communion. And there I would say communion is a really good uh, for, uh, la, communion is a good transition from now you have been together, you have been eating, you have been caring about each other, you have been talking about each other, how you are, and then you share communion and now you start to focus on God, up to God. Communion is much more than what we make it today. And uh, I'm, I'm going to say something that is maybe going to challenge you when I talk about communion. And it's something I haven't been shared be sharing before because it's something new. It's working in me. I'm learning. We are all on our journey. And there we talk especially about the religious classes. Uh, and communion for me is a little like baptism in water. When I was uh, a baby, I got baptized in the Lutheran church as a baby. And... Uh, there was really wrong glasses I got on. And, and then later I came to faith and I started to take the glasses off and I started to understand that baby baptism is, is, that is wrong, that is wrong. But what I did, I took everything I have learned and threw it out and I went from one side of the road to the other side of the road and I thought that baptism was just a symbol. Baptism was not important, it's just a symbol. Because we don't want to look like the Lutheran church where they believe that baby or Catholic church who believe that babies are safe to the water alone. And what many do today is that because of where they come from, they throw everything out and they go from one side to another. And that was what many reformers do through the to the history that some people went from there and say that baptism is just a symbol. Baptism is newer symbol and nothing more. And it was what I have done. But then I started to come into the road again and start to take the glasses off and I, and I started to see what baptism was. And it started with the word of God and I read that in the word of God that baptism is freedom from sin. And I started to preach freedom from sin and because I preached it and people have faith, those who got baptized, they start to, whoa, I experience a freedom from sin. I feel so free and, and, and the word together with that simple faith and the action really was powerful. And we start to preach more and more clear what baptism was. And the, the clearer we preach, the stronger it became. And we start to see demons manifest before they come in the water. And we start to see people set free. And now I have no doubt. And it's so clear and the glasses is off. Baptism is not a symbol. Baptism set us free. Baptism save us from our sins. You cannot live as a disciple of Jesus Christ without being baptized in water. The same when it comes to communion. Communion is the same thing. Out here we have the Catholic Church who took communion in and, and, and make it superstition, make it um, mystery where they, they took the bread and put it in a small box and, and go around with the box. And if that box is, is coming and touching people over the head, they believe that years ago, uh, then, then there was healing power in that. And, and there's many stories that came in from the Catholic Church when it comes to the Eucharist, 
communion, as it's called. Uh, a story was that uh, one time they shared communion and a man, he had some bread in his tea and he took it out and they put it under a microscope. And that bread, what they believe, that they saw a heart beating. Why? Because they believe in the Catholic Church that the wine become physical, become the blood of Jesus. The bread physical become the body of Jesus. They believe that. And they actually believe that the priest, when he do his superstition or his hocus pocus, because this is where the word hocus pocus come from, because they speak Latin and this is where the word come from. When, when the priest did his hocus pocus, the wine become the blood, the bread become the body, physical, and in their mess, they crucify Christ every time. The priest is crucifying Christ every time because of that. And that is what the Catholic Church has been preaching. Then, through the Reformation, through order, they saw that this is off. This is superstition. This is mystery. Mystery. That is off. That is not what we should do. But what have we done? We have gone from one side to another and just say that communion is just a symbol. Now I'm on a journey together with you, hopefully. And now I have come from here to believe that communion is just a symbol. And I'm moving more in here to the middle of the road and starting to get my glasses off. And I start to discover and see that communion is as powerful as baptism in water. It's part of living as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And, and, and we need to understand it. And there is healing in it. There is freedom in it. And there is so much in it we need to rediscover. And I'm going to read some words from the Bible, but I can also go in and, 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 and quote, if I want, the early church. Because everyone in the early church, just the martyrs uh, and all the other people who was living at that time, they all saw communion as much more than we do it today. They didn't believe, none of them believed that communion actually became the body of Christ and became physical, the blood of Jesus. And I also don't believe that. But there is a spiritual thing behind it. Like Jesus in John 6 say, my word are spirit and life. Jesus says his word are spirit and life. In the same way communion <laughs> in a, have a spiritual sense. Communion is also spirit and life. Communion is powerful. But let's read, let's read and look at it. And, and I, I'm excited for this. Okay, if we go to John 6, where Jesus he's talking about that he's the bread of life. He talk about, uh, where, uh, he say, I say you, tell you the truth, that um, it is not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it's my father who gave you the bread from heaven. The bread of God is the bread that came down from heaven and gave life to the world. And here he's talking about his life. He's, Jesus is talking about his body. He talked about that he, the early church, the Elab, the Israelites in Egypt, they got manna from heaven and they ate the manna. But Jesus is now talking about the new bread that have come down from heaven. And that is him. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here, here is the bread that came down from heaven which any, everyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Truly, truly, I tell you, unless you eat my flesh, and eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. 
you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them on the last day. For my life is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Whoa, that is strong words these are saying. And out of those words, you can almost get the idea why the Catholics start to believe that it actually became physical, the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus. And I'm just reading what the word is saying. Jesus, this is communion he's talking about here. And it's so clear. And, and also when he talked about communion in Matthew 26, he said, we read here, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. So the body Jesus was talking about that would give life to you and me. <laughs> that was what he did in the communion. He don't say this become my body, like in a, in, in, in a way like the Catholic Church, they take the thing and the priest do some hocus pocus, what, why the word hocus pocus come from, and, and make it the body and blood of Jesus. This is not what Jesus said. He said it is already. In a spiritual sense, this is. Not in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense, this is my body. And then he took a cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which it pour out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Strong words. I'm just reading for the Bible. If you then go to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this as remembrance of me. And uh, when you look at remembrance, I think that is also a strong thing in communion. We need to remember what Jesus has done. We need to remember the cross. We need to keep that focus. It's, it's interesting how, how easy it is to take things for granted. Like, I, just let's say you get a birthday gift, a big, big gift, and you are so happy for that gift, and you are so thankful that you have got that amazing gift. And the first days you are thankful, the first weeks you are thankful, then, but after some month or a year, you don't appreciate it anymore. You take it for granted. The same way, sadly, is that we can do the same with Jesus. Yeah, I'm forgiven. Yeah, he has forgiven me. Oh, Jesus, live in me. What do that mean? And I think when you come together, and you bread the bread. You do it as a remembrance. You, 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 you think of it. You remember it. You understand it again and again and again. And this is what Jesus did for us. And there is power in that. And I think that is an important thing for us as believers to always keep that focus on Christ and remember the cross and, and, and bread the bread. But he continued, in the same way he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant, covenant of my blood. Do this, whoever drink of this in remembrance of me. But then he continued Paul here and saying that whoever drink, uh, eat the bread and drink the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty and sinning against the blood body and the blood of Jesus. So Paul is actually saying that if you take communion in a wrong way, you are sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. And there he said, therefore, whoever come together 
and trains should examine themselves so they will not be judged. And he actually go further, and I'll not read it all. He said that because people don't examine themselves and because judgment is coming to the body, many people are sick and dying in the church. Why, why would Paul say that when you do this in a wrong way, you are sinning against the body and the blood, and therefore many are sick and dying, if that was just a symbol? Because Paul did not see communion as a symbol. The early church did not see communion as a symbol. And it's time for us to also get our glasses off and understand what communion is. It's not just a symbol. What I have discovered is that I have met people when they understood what baptism in water was, who came down in water and came up and like, I'm free, I'm free. And they feel so free, they feel so clean, they, free. they are was clean, they are free. And, and you just see it in their face, you see the life in them, you see the freedom in them. But what I've had, when I've had all are Christian who are baptizing people and they come up and say, I am so free. The old Christian have looked at me and say, oh, I really would like to have that experience again to feel so free if I could just get baptized one more time. And then it hit me, baptism should only be one time, but communion is every time we come together. There is freedom in it. And what happened is that we in our life, when we walk with Christ, we, people would fall, they would get dirty again. <laughs> they cannot get washed away again and again and again. People would struggle with sickness and other things. And Jesus paid the price. He died on the cross for our sins. He died for our sickness. He had paid the price. He wants to forgive us. He wants to heal us. And yes, in faith, I believe we can confess our sins from each other. And there is forgiveness because God is righteous to forgive us. I believe that we can lay hands on each other and pray in faith. And we can see healing. Why? Because the Bible promises us so. But I also believe there is an extra strong tool, if we can use the word tool, and that is communion. Because you come together. And you are remembering what Jesus has done. Now we can, like the woman who touched Jesus and her power went out from him and healed her. We cannot physically touch Jesus because Jesus is not walking here on earth today. But in remembering of him, spiritual, Jesus, you died on a cross. You got broken for us. By your wounds, we are healed. By your blood, we are forgiven. And then when we in faith take the bread, I believe we can do it in faith and we can experience healing through that. I believe we can drink the, 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 the blood or the wine, it's not blood, drink the wine and experience in faith, experience the spiritual thing behind it that I am free. I'm cleansed. Yes, I have done wrong things and I have been falling, but I am free again and I stand as a new child in front of God. And that is the power in communion and that has been lost. Like baptism water has been lost. But the difference between baptism water and communion is baptism water is only one time. Communion is every time we come together, we can do it as a remembering and as a spiritual thing where we in faith. And that is the thing, is faith. Like the Catholic Church, when they baptize babies, they believe there is something holy with the words. The words is holy. The priest is holy. The water is even holy. And they believe that is what makes baptism baptism. In the same way, they believe that to communion is only... 
the priest and it's the thing the priests do and it's that thing, but that is mystery. So mystery, that, that is, we don't want that. That is superstition, we don't want that. It's not special water. We can baptize people in a rainwater container. We do that. We can baptize people in a sea, in an ocean. We can baptize people wherever it is. And it's, everyone can baptize. It's the faith we put into it and not the magical water. The same way with the communion. It should be a love feast where you come together, you eat, and then you take the bread and then you eat it and you take the wine and you drink it and you do that with faith expecting God to move and you experience freedom. I remember some years ago uh, we had a church uh, gathering where our, our wits came in, a woman came in, a wits. She, was, she didn't like us at all, but she was in there she didn't have problem with the preaching. She didn't have problem with the worship. But when we started to take communion, she couldn't handle to be in the room and she left the room. We have started to see more and more people experience freedom. We have started to see more and more people get healed. Why? Because we are starting to preach it as it is. If you just preach it as something symbolic, you will not experience the power thereof. But when you know what it is, it is powerful. And therefore, I want to say that I think the next years we will have more and more testimonies of what communion really is. And I encourage you to deep deeper into it, see it. And then when you come together, start to do it in faith, in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there I also want to say that communion should, as I see it, only be for the, uh, Christian disciples not people who don't live with Christ. And that is why you see in John uh, 13 that Jesus, he was together with all his 12 disciples. Before he took communion, he, he gave up bread and gave it to Judas, who was betraying him, and Judas left. When Judas had left the room, Jesus shared communion with the rest of the eleven. Why? Because I think that Jesus saw the heart with Judas and he didn't want Judas to be part of that love feast and be part of that communion in that way. Um, so it was a little about communion. I can say more about that and I want to do that later. But I think when you come together, come together, share life with each other, talk with each other, then eat some food if you can, and then take some bread, break it. How do you do it? There is not a, like, do it in faith. What kind of bread it is, I don't believe it matters. What you drink, I don't believe it matters. It matters the faith. It's, it matters to understand in faith what it is. Jesus, you died on the cross. <laughs> Your blood is spill, spool, spill, uh, given for me. I take this in faith and I eat it. Thank you for your, uh, by your wounds I am healed, Jesus. I thank you for your blood. It's cleansing me. And then we experience that freedom it is in it. So you come together, you share communion, and then you spend time where you focus on God. Into each other, up to God. Read the word. Read the word. I know people who have come together and they have seen the Pioneer School here, online Pioneer School I've done. They've seen it during the week and then they come together and they talk about the Pioneer School. I think that is good. I recommend that. If you do that for a short time, now we don't have a lot of lessons. <laughs> so you can do it for a short time because I believe something is more important that is just taking the word. Just come together and read the word. Not verses, if you can, not just sermons. But why not just read the word? Read a, a chapter or two together. Then read a chapter and two. Then talk about what have you just read. What is it God is speaking to us about? And then maybe out of that chapter you take time to pray and you seek God. And you say, God, what is it you are speaking to me about? What is you are speaking to us about today as your body? 
And this is a simple way where you don't have to have a preacher to come together and meet with people because you let the word speak. You come together, you have fellowship with each other. You share communion. And then you focus on God. And then you read the word. And then you share, talk about the word. What is the word saying to you? What is God saying? And, and there I would say, maybe share, let other different people read every time. So one read a half chapter and one read another half chapter and one read or you, you share reading the word and then you talk about it and let other people talk. So it's not always the same person we're talking all the time. This is a good way to get the word inside. And I know people who have used this model in, up and out. What they have done also is that during the week, before you meet, maybe next week, everyone read a chapter or two in the Bible or three or four or book. And then they come together and they have all read the same during the week. And then they sit and talk about what they have read. This is a good way you can do it. Again, there is no model because you read in the Bible when Paul came together often with people, he spoke the whole night. But this is a good way when you are two and three who are meeting or four and five. Because if you are 10, 15, 20 people, you cannot have time to, to always hear what everyone has to say. So into each other, fellowship with each other. Eat, have fellowship. Then you break the bread, power in it, healing, freedom, love it. Then you focus on God. You take the word, the apostles teaching. You take the word and you read the word and you talk about the word. What is the word saying to us? How do we lift this out? So the word do not just become a sermon, sermon but it become practical. And then you then out to order. How do we now share what we have heard with other people out there in the world? How do we obey Jesus in what he's saying in Luke chapter 10? Who do you know who is the person of peace you want to read during the week? Who do you want to share the gospel to? Who do you want to pray for? And then have fellowship. I just put down here. Have fellowship and talk about what you want to do how you want to reach out to other people and then be responsible for each other. Where you maybe sit together and talk about what do I want to do during the week. And I think the reason out to other is, is, is so important to keep the focus. Love God, love your neighbor and go out and make disciples. It's so important to keep the focus. Remember, we, you are missionary here on earth. No matter if you have a full-time job, you are a missionary. I actually had a, a, a got an idea a long time ago, or came with a, a, a funny example. Try to imagine you are in a church, and in that church, they have some missionaries they have sent, for example, to another country, to Africa, let's say that. And you as a church, you are supporting this family who are missionaries in Africa. And that family, they share a newsletter, they write a newsletter and send home to your church every month. If you as a church are supporting this family and you get the newsletter and this is what you read, they are church, we are so thankful for your support to us. Things are going really good here in Zambia. James is happy in school and he has started to play football with the other boys and have having a really good time. He has started to play matches every weekend. Rebecca, our small little daughter, she like also playing with the girls and doing this and this. My husband and me, we have just been built a big pool and we have started to go hunting. And we like hunting and my husband have just shot a big, big animal and so on. And they just tell about what they're doing with 
games and fun and hunting and pool and barbecue and all of that. And then of course, yes, we also go to church two hours every Sunday. Thank you, church, for supporting us. Please send more money. If you got a newsletter like this, I think you will stop sending money to that missionary couple. Why? Because they're not missionaries. They're just going to church. They're living their own life, having fun, and going to church two hours every Sunday. You expect more for them. Why? Because they're missionaries. We are missionaries. You are missionaries. We are sent out here on earth in Christ's place. And every one of us, no matter if you have a full-time job or not, every one of us should be able to write a newsletter every month. If you don't have a church to send it to, just write it and read it loud to God. Dear church, <laughs> thank you. This last month has been really challenging. But we have been out Saw in the word of God, we have been reaching out, we have come together, we are praying, and we have been meeting in that house, and we have been going on the street there, and we have been meeting that home, and we are working with, and we are baptized three people, and we are praying for things who have got healed, and we are working with them and them and them and them. This is how our diary, our newsletter should be, no matter what country we are from. If you have small groups where you start to meet people, two and three people, and come together, and then you meet. You have time with each other, you spend time with God, and then you talk about what do you do to reach out? Who do you reach out to? Who do you want to reach out to during the week? And maybe you then talk about, hey, I have a friend here, I want to reach out to him next Monday. Hey, I can join you. Yeah, let's go together. And then during the week, you end up going together and fulfill the word Jesus has given you. This is what church could look like. What you can do, you can also do this in small groups and two and three, and then there's other small groups and two and three, and they come together and suddenly you're 10 and 50, and then of course you do it a little different. Because do you know what the model is from church? There's no model. There's I, principles. There is it is important that we keep to the apostles' teaching. It is important that we keep to the fellowship. It is important that we break the bread. It is important that we pray for each other and pray to God and hear his voice. It is important that we love God. It is important that we love each other. It is important that we go out and make disciples. But there is not one model of how to do church. Like there is no, not one model of how to do family. So what I want to encourage you in is that what I've been trying to do in the Pioneer School, the last 28 lessons, is that I've been trying to help to get those classes off. In the first lesson, I talk about the Catholic Church and how we need to draw away from that. And with every lesson, I'm trying to give you a DNA, give you a foundation so you can get the right understanding of who God is, what the gospel is, what the command is Jesus has given, what church is like, how you grow people up from baby to spiritual giants, how you see the fivefold ministry, and how you can meet together. All of this is supposed to take the glasses off, so you, instead of looking at models, look at God, look at people around you, look at how you effective can reach out, and what you will do and how you do it will be different from how your neighbor is doing it. Because what do we have now? We have a training center. Why do we have this? Because it's effective. This is the DNA. <laughs> And, and this is what is effective now. Can everyone go and do exactly like us? No. If I was another place where I did not have a training center, I would not do like this. If I go to a new city where I know no one, what will I start to do there? I will start to pray and find a person of peace. When I find that person, I will work with that person to reach the household. Until I reach the household, maybe I start to reach a few people, then I will meet like this, in, up and out. 
I will meet with them. How are you? How have your time been? Are you struggling? Let's pray for you. Let's help you. Let's build you up. Have, have communion. Share that. Focus on God. Then we take the word of God. We read it together. We get the word under their skin. We read the word together. We help them to eat themselves from being baby to spiritual uh, young ones and eat themselves. And then I ask them, okay, who can we reach out to? Who do you have our friends and family we can reach during the week? And then we go and do it. And then it grow. And when it grow up, Maybe when they start to reach more people, then I say, what I've done with you, you now do with them. Now you start to meet with your two friends during the week. And what I've been doing with you, you now do with them. And then they meet with their friends during the week. And then what, maybe one time, every second week or every month, we come together, all of us, and have a big celebration. This is what I would do. But it's again different from place to place. So I hope you have have good time with the Pioneer School. I hope you will go back and see the lessons again. Because what I've heard from people is that because of the we have been working like trying to take the glasses off, I've heard from people when they go back and see the all 28 lessons again, that they get new things out of it because suddenly they see it more clear because now the religious glasses is off. As I said what, last time, I wanted to end up, and this will maybe, I thought that would, this would be the last, last lesson on the Pioneer School because we want to start off with a Jesus radio and we want to start something new. So I said last time that this would be the last one. But I actually have one more because I had one more where I would talk about finish the race. And I will do that very short. Uh, so next time I will talk about how do you finish the race and then we end up the Pioneer School. See you next time. God bless you. Bye bye.